In this clip, I'm going to finish talking about serial correlation and how to test for it in time series models. Okay, so remember we spoke briefly in lecture about how in any model, any armor type model, we need that the shocks, the error term epsilon t, are serially uncorrelated so that OLS is going to be consistent, i.e. if a sample size large enough, the OLS estimator won't be biased. Even more fundamental than that, we saw it was important for any model to not have serially correlated errors because if not, it means we're missing some of the dynamics. So another reason we want to see whether or not there's serial correlation is to see whether our model is dynamically complete. And this just means that our model, for say some, ar some armor model that we specified, whether or not it explains all of the dynamics. If it does, there's no, there's no correlation in the errors and it's complete. If not, it's incomplete. Okay, so for example, when we estimate an AR1 model, okay, then we require that the errors are serially uncorrelated, such that OLS, otherwise OLS will be biased. Okay, which means if the errors are currently correlated with each other, then in almost all cases, in most cases, it will cause a bias because it will mean the errors are correlated with our regressor. Okay. So we can see then, for example, take the case where the errors have a correlation at leg 1, i.e. take the case where the errors, the shocks here, are correlated at leg 1. Then we can see by construction then, given the recursive form of an AR1, if the errors are correlated at leg 1, then the error must be correlated with yt minus 1. Therefore, there must be a correlation between the error and the regressor, which causes a bias. Okay, and why is that? Well, we can see that, you know, yt minus 1, again, recursing back one period, equals yt minus 2. Okay, so if epsilon t is correlated with epsilon t minus 1, then epsilon t is correlated with the shock here, and therefore epsilon t must be correlated with yt minus 1, which here lead to a bias. Okay, we've, we've in essence got a circularity. The OLS estimator, OLS will not be centered around theta 1. So the OLS, what that means is theta hat 1, as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it'll be tending to something which isn't theta 1. Call it theta 1 star, it doesn't equal thi 1. So OLS is biased. And again, I'm not going to go into proofs of this, but you know from your second year econometrics course, in order for OLS to be consistent and have nice properties, the a crucial assumption is the errors are unrelated or uncorrelated with the regressors, with the independent variables, and here we can see they're not. Our regressor now is the lag of the dependent variable, and these are sometimes called lag-dependent variable models. Even more fundamental than causing a bias, as, again, as, said, as said above, if the, if the errors were correlated, it means that AR1 doesn't capture all the dynamics. It's not dynamically complete. <coughs> which means, in essence, we have a model misspecification, which we're going to see now. It means we've missed out some of the dynamics, we've missed some variables out, we've not specified the whole picture of the dynamics. So let's take an example of an AR1 model where the errors are also an AR1. Okay. What can we see here? Well, we can see uh, we can work out the residuals at any time period. Again, just just rearranging the above. Okay. Well, what do we know is from above? We can work them out from here. Well, epsilon t is y t minus mu minus theta one y t minus one, and again recursive back one period. We're going to get the same thing, but we're just back one period. Minus one, minus two. Okay, then we can plug. Then we can plug it in into the equation. Okay, so we just plug epsilon t into here and epsilon t minus one into here, and we can solve and get the equation below. We can rearrange. What can we see there? Well, if we rearrange all this out, we can take out, we're going to get yt equals, take mu, we're going to get mu plus thi1 
yt minus 1, taking this over here, plus d to 1, yt minus 1, And if we expand it out, and we can see we're going to get an AR2 model. We're going to get minus theta 1 mu minus pi 1 theta 1 yt minus 2 plus a white noise term. So we can collect all the terms we're going to get just a constant, which is going to be mu 1 minus theta 1. Plus, we're going to get some coefficient on yt minus 1. And we're going to get minus phi 1 theta 1 yt minus 2 plus vt. This is just an AR, this is now just an AR2 model. This is the constant. This is the coefficient on yt minus 1. This is the coefficient on yt minus 2. Okay, so unless theta equals 1, which means that there is no correlation in the errors, and or phi 1 equals what not, which means that there is no AR term, so that it's just a white noise process, then we have zero correlation. The true process is an AR2. Okay? Okay? So then, we can see then, what this is an example, if we have an AR1 model, and our error terms also are an AR1 model, it means the true model then is an AR2 process, where the remaining error is a white noise. This would now be a dynamically complete model. Okay, and all these ideas generalise. Okay, when the errors, the errors being serially correlated just means they follow some process. It could be an AR1, an armor one one, and we can work out what the true form of the process will be, given some knowledge about the form of the correlation, the errors. This is useful then, because when we do OLS, we have we specified some model, say an AR2 and AR3. One check we often would run on it is that these that the errors are ser to check whether the errors are correlated or not. And if they were correlated, we'd like to have an idea of the form they take, such that we can have a theoretical idea of what the true form of the process maybe. Okay, so this idea generalizes to the case where we specify an ARP, but the true disturbances follow an ARM. So we just did the example P equals 1 and M equals 1. But now it all generalizes. So again, phi L, this, this is just a lag operator form of an ARP. It's just 1 minus phi 1 L minus phi 2 L squared minus dot dot dot. Yeah. So this is the this is the ARP lag in, in in lag operator form, and now we're saying that the errors called UT here satisfy. Well, the, they're also a, they're also an um, an ARM, which just means for some coefficients we have one minus thy one L L squared dot, dot minus thy M L M. If we rearrange all this out, it just means UT equals I one U T minus one. Okay, just using the definition of the lag operator form. Okay, where epsilon T is white noise. Well remember we can use the fact that the, the lag operator behaves like it's a polynomial. Well we can just solve then for U T. Treating it as if we can divert by both sides by one by psi of L to the minus one. Okay, so we can solve for ut here, then we can plug from 3 back into 2, and we can solve then for yt and find the true form of the process, which is exactly what we just did, doing it by hand, for the case above, of an AR1 into an, for an AR1 model where the errors are also an AR1 form. So we can solve, then we can plug back in. So now we have that, plugging in ut into 3 will tell us that, before we got to this line, that phi of L, y, t, equals a constant plus, again, solve, we've solved in for u, t. Then we just now multiply both sides by phi to the L, because again, it behaves like a polynomial. And remember, because alpha is a constant, phi L of 
alpha just equals phi 1 of alpha. It behaves as if L equals 1 because remember L alpha, L, L of J to the alpha always just equals alpha. So it behaves as if L equals 1. Okay, so then this is the true form of the process here. If we have ARP model where the errors are an ARM, then the true process takes its form here. Well, what's this? This is just a p order polynomial multiplied by an mth order polynomial. When we expand all this out, we don't need, you, don't need, you don't need to do this. You can just state, obviously, a p order polynomial times by an nth order is just going to be a p plus m order polynomial, which by definition then is just an ARP plus M model. For example, if P equals 2 and M equals 2, then a quadratic times by another quadratic is going to be something to the power of 4. We're going to get a an AR4 model. Okay? And we just saw the example above for the case P equals 1 and M equals 1. We found an AR2. So the result generalizes. Okay? If we have an ARP process, Whatever, when we normally specify P, then if the errors follow some other ARM process, it means a true process was an ARP plus M, which means if we run an ARP plus M model with P plus M lags, we specified all the dynamics and the errors will no longer be serially correlated with each other. Everything then generalizes to the case where the errors are now an MAQ process. Well, that's even easier because by definition, it just means we have an armor PQ model. So again, plug in, we just plug in, remember this is, this is just UT here. Remember, this is, we just plugged in UT into here. This is just the definition of an armor PQ in its lag operator form. Okay. So then, that's quite general then. We've seen if we have an, an ARP model and ARM errors, we get an ARP plus M. And if we've got an ARP model with an MAQ error, then we have an armor PQ model. And we could do the same thing for mod we could do the same thing for any model. Okay? You just if as you've seen here, there's not really any statistics going on to speak. We're just solving and rearranging equations. Okay? I'm given so now then we move on to testing for serial correlation. So we've seen why it's an issue. First of all, if we have serial correlation in our model, it means that OLS will be biased. Even more fundamental than that, if we have correlation in the error term, it means we've missed out some dynamics. Okay? So I'm now going to talk about methods to test for serial correlation. And we're going to highlight all this through the example of the AR1 because everything generalizes to an armor PQ. Everything I say here generalizes to an armor PQ. Instead of estimating an AR1, you estimate the armor PQ and do the exact same steps. So we want to test the null hypothesis that the error term is serially uncorrelated, and we've talked about why that is. Okay, under the null, the null un, under, the, under the hypothesis there is no serial correlation, then we can estimate these unknown parameters, mu and thi1. These are the key entities left that we need to know. So we can, we want to perform a test that epsilon t is serial and correlated. But the main issue is we don't observe epsilon t because it's the shock, it's the unobservable. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can use the fact that under the null, we can estimate them by replacing the actual parameters with their OLS estimates. So mu hat is the OLS estimate of mu. So these are the OLS Estimator. And again, we, we can get the formula quite simply in this case of one regressor, but again you don't need to you don't need to be able to memorize the formulas. So under the null then, the estimated residuals should be roughly near to the actual shocks under the null hypothesis because under the null mu hat is tending to mu and thi hat one is tending to thi. So as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that we know the estimates are consistent because under the null hypothesis, the errors are serially uncorrelated. So under the null, we know that OLS works and is not biased. So if it's not biased, we can consistently estimate the parameters, which means we can consistently estimate the residuals, and then we can test in these 
The idea is then, because under the null our estimated residuals are near the true ones, we can then just test if there's any correlation in the estimated residual. Under the null, they shouldn't be none, because they should be near to the true residual. But as always, we need to count for the sampling error, okay? just as we need to form a hypothesis test. Okay? The most obvious method then is we've got, we've got the residuals, we can then, if they were correlated, we could test well. We could test whether the errors were an ARP. So we can test if they're an ARP or not. So we've got, we've got the estimated residuals. We can regress them on P of the legs. Again, we don't need the constant because by construction, the residuals have got mean naught. We can run this regression. The null hypothesis is that all the betas are not. This would mean that there's no serial correlation because well, in, in an ARP, if they all betas were not, then there's no serial correlation in this model here. And then against the null, that at least one of them is not equal to not. Under under the alternative, sorry. So under the alternative, there is serial correlation. Under the under the null, there is there is no serial co there's no serial correlation in this ARP model here. So all we do is we run the regression, get the residuals, et, then we. Calculate the F statistic by running the regression in 9. We then compare the F statistic to the relevant F distribution. And it's going to be the F statistic will be F distributed with P degrees of freedom and T minus P minus 1 degree. This is sample size minus number, sorry, minus 2, minus number of Number, number of residuals added here and number of parameters we estimated. This was nu and thi1. Okay. So p is the number of lags we're testing. T is the sample size. P is again the number of lags. And then the last part is the number of parameters we estimated to estimate the residual. And again, this is all done in E views. You just have to understand the idea of where it's coming from and be able to run the test. Another method, which is less obvious, and again, you run what's called an auxiliary regression. You run this regression here. You regress yt on all p lags of y and m lags of the residual. Okay. The null then is that all the all the coefficients on the residuals are not against the alternative that at least one of them is a not not. And it turns out that under the null, t times the r squared, the measure of fit from this auxiliary regression, is distributed as a chi squared m if the null is true. And again, you're not expected to prove this, so under h naught, it turns out that if there was no serial correlation, then the r squared from this auxiliary regression here, the r squared from here multiplied by t tends towards a chi squared m, where m is the number of lags we included. Okay? This is allowing us to test whether the errors are an AR process again. Okay? So there are two ways to test for serial correlation. And we're going to give an example now. So again, you just need to understand the idea and be able to do implement these tests with an e-views. In e-views. Again, it's supposed to be especially useful for the project. So here we've run an AR1 on GDP growth. And we found, so remember this here is our mu hat. This is thi hat 1, our estimate of the, of the AR1 coefficient. Okay, <clears throat> so this says that there's a positive 0.6 coefficient on the AR1 coefficient. And the constant is around 0.23. And again, this, we would reject the null that, we were going to reject the null that mu equals not and thi 1 equals not because the p-values are almost not. The p-value being the, the, the probability of the null is true, where the null is mu equals naught and phi 1 equals naught. Okay? So then we now want to see whether the model is dynamically complete. Well, the bottom part has, and we'll see how to do this in eView. We can perform this test in eView. We've produced a serial correlation LM test. Okay? This here has specified, this here we can see there's four here, but this is tested for four legs. So this is tested, errors are an AR4. In eViews, you can test, you can choose the number of lags you want. We've selected four here because we have quarterly data. So it's normally good practice. If you have, say, monthly data, you'd specify 12 lags. 
and if there's quarterly data specify four and he's done, he's done each of the tests this part one does the F test we get the F statistic and we see then the P value is given here the P value is 0.6 it's saying the probability not is true is very high and it does this does this does the Bruce Godfrey test they're both testing the same null here, and that's why they, they almost always give the same outcome. This is the test statistic, t times r squared, and this is the p-value. The probability null is true is, again, pretty much the same as for the f-test. They're both saying, except the null, there's no evidence to suggest that there's serial correlation in the error term, which is giving us some strong evidence that the AR1 is dynamically complete, which also corresponds to what we saw in lecture. Okay, remember, we saw that the correlogram of GDP growth looked very near to an AR1, and this verifies it then. Okay, so that's everything on serial correlation and testing for serial correlation.